Pushkin. Sixteen years have passed since the Black Crows last put out an album of all new material. The world's changed a lot since then, and it appears so have the Robinson brothers. Chris and Rich Robinson are, of course, the backbone of the group. They started together back in Georgia in 84 as Mr. Crow's Garden, before moving to NYC, signing with Deaf American, and changing their name to the Black Crows. The band's debut album, Shake Your Money Maker, set them up as torchbearers of Southern rock for the 90s and beyond. As you'll hear in our conversation, the brothers Robinson have had a competitive relationship for a long time. Their ups and downs have meant hiatuses for the band over the years, but now they're back united and seemingly in it for the long haul with their new album, Happiness Bastards. On today's episode, I talked to Chris Robinson about his growing up in Georgia with Rich, their dad's rockabilly career, his listening routine that includes Sudanese and Sufi music, and how his road habits have changed from indulging in champagne and other substances to reading Herman Melville. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's my conversation with Chris Robinson of the Black Crows. Is that a gun club, like the band shirt that you got on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I love gun club, man. Jeffrey Lee Pierce, one of my faves. And it's funny because, you know, when we started, people would always say we sounded like, and we did. We had, you know, there was the jangle sort of indie pop thing. R.E.M., of course, being the purveyors of that, but Let's Active and the DBs and then bands from California, like Game Theory, we kind of were into like this kind of jangly um, 60s inspired. But we really sounded early days a lot like the Gun Club, you know, because Gun Club and X are very interesting to me in the like early punk scene here in Los Angeles because they were the, well, I guess you could put the blasters and the plugs in there too. Blasters are from SF, though, right? Oh, Blasters are a L.A. band, too. Yeah. Are they? Oh, okay, cool. They had those kind of rootsy things, you know? And it would yeah. be really early on that we would think, like, okay, well, Jeffrey Lee Pierce is like a punk icon, but he plays a Robert Johnson song on the first record, you know? I mean, it doesn't yeah. sound like Robert Johnson, but needless to say, he found great inspiration and the mythology and the imagery and the vibration of like the blues and stuff, which other punk bands really didn't. Whatever music is happening in LA, there's always some subset of it that countrifies it. You know, it's like, even with the birds, like Sweetheart of the Rodeo, like all that stuff, like the birds got into that. And, you know, I don't know, you could even feel that with Buffalo Springfield or, I mean, I know like Neil's from Canada or whatnot, but they're making music here, you know? Of course, of course. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, while that's going on, Tim Buckley's here. And you know what I mean? And while that's going on, you have bands like the Chambers Brothers and yeah. Eric Burden Leaves the Animals and a Northern English white band playing blues music. And then he's the lead singer of War. Of I War. Mean- <laughs> and War is like such a quintessential L.A., Long Beach, in fact, group, you know? I mean, I think, obviously, their subsequent most famous records don't include Eric Burden. Yeah. And it's funny, it also just goes to show how, that's just how music is, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I guess you, obviously you can make examples of things that seem heavy handed or things that don't contain a certain authenticity. But I mean, that was a big deal when I, you know, talking about growing up in a band, being from Atlanta, being like in a, arguably the most progressive city in terms of race relations in if not america and maybe globally that's interesting it probably has to be i mean you might i I might have been tempted to say new orleans but i think when you kind of look at the musical legacy of atlanta over the last i mean new orleans most definitely but atlanta is different because of the black universities yeah like kind of concentrated there and atlanta having maynard jackson as the first black mayor the first black police chief first black police force in the deep south when i first landed in atlanta i gotta say coming from la because i grew up in la when i first landed in atlanta and i'm in the airport i'm like where the where am i like how is the (laughs) whole airport is black this is crazy it was the the weirdest experience for me funny that's funny and as a i said i'm a third generation atlantan and i don't really make the connection of being like I'm I'm a southern person but my connection is with Atlanta. Yeah. And so you know, it's funny cuz Maynard Jackson's the guy who when Hartfield International Airport becomes an international airport, he's the one who's like we're not doing anything unless 
black business owners are recognized and have a piece in this and what that can mean for the community. Something very subtle like that still reverberates, I think. And besides the culture, because you start to see Atlanta also be a, a city, you know, famous for the musicians and the hip hop and the athletes that all move there. But the reason that becomes attractive is because of decisions like that and the, the hard line that someone like Maynard Jackson would take and how Atlanta had been pried open. Of course, having the great Reverend be from there, you know, gives Atlanta a different perspective. But I don't know, it's a unique place in that way. And it's funny, like I speak on it from the past because I really left First check I got in the Black Crows, I moved to New York. Being in a band to me was like, you know, shooting an arrow over the mountain. Like just, I I wanted to get out in the world. Had you been to New York before you moved there? Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, our dad, Rich and I's dad was a singer. He had a top 40 rock and roll hit in the 50s called Boom a Dip Dip. You can check it out on Spotify. I've listened to some of that stuff. It's, stuff. it's, it's <laughs> really Robert. good, man. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's a good song. It's like really happening. And up in New York and he was like, you know, into the theater and music and acting and dance, you know, so he wanted that too at a certain time in his life. And he was in New York and, um, and it's funny, my mom was a flight attendant for the old Eastern Airlines. And you know, it's funny, she told me, she goes, oh, I served Dr. King many times on flights out of Atlanta. Wow. Which I always thought really blew my mind as a kid, you know? Of course you did. I would make, I mean, how many flights out of Atlanta must he have taken? You know? Yeah, that was, like, I mean, all the time, you yeah, know? You yeah. know, so I moved to New York first and I still love New York. And some of my deepest connections and friendships are there. My wife and I just got back from there yesterday. But I came to Los Angeles and I don't know, it was farther away. From Georgia? Yeah, from everything. Oh, I mean, yeah. California as an idea, California, later I would get to know far more about this state. And I lived up north for six years and I was in this little hippie band and we started, we did nine weeks just up and down California in a van playing all the little beach towns and hippie towns. And, you know, I got a real appreciation for, do you, do you remember Huell Hauser? Oh, come on, man. California's gold, baby. I was like the psychedelic <laughs> Huell Hauser. You know what I mean? You know, Huell Hauser was always like, so this is an Adobe. Wow. He was amazed about everything, too. <laughs> He's like, so this is a bowl of menudo. <laughs> I love Huell Hauser. When I I the late great, man. The late great Huell Hauser, man. I love, and you know what? I, th he was always so excited. He yeah. saw every mission from San Diego to like, you know, the, the Oregon border. So that's the, the mission. You're like so excited. Everything was ecstatic to him. It was crazy. It was so, that was, that was a funny show to watch, man. I loved it. When I moved here, I was like, what is this? This is fantastic. <laughs> I also am lucky that when I'm, I'm so I moved here in 91, nine, early 92. That was the golden age of public television. Yeah, I mean, the weirdest, weirdest of the weird stuff would come on TV, man, on the couple of public stations on your cable, like Channel 6 and Channel 14 or whatever. The most unimaginably, I mean, obviously, like Tim and Eric. I don't know if you ever got into Tim and oh, Eric. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hilarious. So Tim and Eric, like, take the inspiration of that into their twisted world for the series, yeah. which is Still some of my favorite stuff. You don't need a Chinese massage, you need an Italian massage. It was fantastic, you know what I mean? And, and you know the other thing about things that were really, I've always been interested in outsider culture, you know, when those would be like driven by like this, but, but because it's Hollywood, it made it even weirder. Like I'm on TV now, I'm famous too, you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of predated the psychosis that has become social media, you know? Yeah, yeah. People always describe LA when they come to LA as being closer to the industry, as being closer to things. But I also find that you can find your your niches and say way out of the way of the industry if you want. I did it. Yeah. I mean, when I moved to Topanga Canyon at a certain point, I I, I moved to Topanga because I had these romantic notions of what Northern California and what well, I've been to Northern California, but what it might feel like not to be in LA, but to still be able to be in LA for different reasons. I'm of the firm belief that Los Angeles is one of the great cities in the world. And yeah. 
which is also unique because of how new this city is comparatively. In 1860, there's 5,000 people living here. That's wild. And ranchers and spread out, and it's just uh, come over from Mexican rule and stuff from that government, and they had, de you know, gave everyone deeds to these massive fincas and ranches and things that were all of California, you know, so... It's not that old in the big scheme of things. But the other funny thing is when I came here, <laughs> I was I laugh all the time because it was like growing up in Atlanta, or whatever, in 19, I had my first sushi in 1989. My <laughs> guy wanted, was ended up being our manager, like took me and Rich with some friends to get sushi. And uh, that place was called Imperial Gardens or whatever. It was right there on Sunset. It's now like a taco place or something but it was the Roxbury later but anyway we're sitting there and like I, of course I know what it is but I've you know Stan and Nancy Robinson in Atlanta we didn't do <laughs> you know what I mean like I remember being 16 and telling my dad like coming downstairs one day and I was like why have we never had Indian food my dad was like you're right we should go get it and I was like we all drove to the one Indian restaurant you know and it was amazing wow. Wow. But when I'm here in 1989, I'm still working on the first album and I'm a kid from Atlanta. But the cool thing is it's a mentality. You get farther away from where you come from. And like anything else, you figure out what's delicious about it and what's special about it. And now it has a place in your culinary like thing. Yeah. That, like, Tonight's sushi, we want to go and you know what I mean? And then you yeah. can enjoy it on another level. But there was one time where you're, you know, I come to L.A., I don't know anything about anything, and I don't even know what this is. How far removed from Atlanta do you feel now? Like, do you feel like an Atlantan? <laughs> I mean, not especially. And none of that is to be taken as if Atlanta has feelings. <laughs> I do love Atlanta more than ever, but it's also, I like the remnants of the Atlanta that I remembered. So when you go back, you don't see the... I mean, man, it's changed. There was this thing on Peach Street called the Darlington Apartments, and there used to have this digital thing, and it would be like 2,999,000, you know what I mean? That, you know, and it, it was the population, and it, wow. and it got older with the population sign. It got bigger, and it went to 3 million in 1990. Wow. You know, we used to hang around this monthly thing called the Mud Shack and this after hours Mexican burrito place and it was a poetry reading and just the poet would get on stage like I live in a city of three million people as if it was like you know this Atlanta of this it's almost eight million people now yeah it's yeah right that sounds about right it's huge so we're not there I mean of course I love it but most a lot of the Atlanta you know the house where we used to rehearse and have parties is now the Federal Reserve the club wow. that we based all our rock and roll dreams and mythology on is now at a you know place where people go get stitches or whatever you know what i mean like all of that kind of stuff from back in the 80s when the world was new and music was all our career was ahead of us that's all kind of gone yeah you can see the the skeleton of it you know what i mean yeah we'll come back with more of my interview with chris robinson after this quick break We're back with Chris Robinson. Do you get excited to tour these days? Like, can you still get excited about it? I do, I do. It was funny, I've done a couple of interviews for this project, and I'm like shocked that the people have said, you're the first musician who says they still find inspiration doing what you do, and being on tour, they say, is so boring. I'm like, I've never lost the dream. And again, I've never been bored. You know what I mean? Even as a kid, like if my mom and dad go to your room, I'd be like, I'm amazing. <laughs> That's all I want to do. All my yeah. records are in there. The books I'm reading are in there. I can draw. I can dream. You know what I mean? Daydream. I mean, I was somewhere. There's a permanent record of me and all it says is prone to daydreaming. <laughs> Not very good at math. Yeah, right. But I, I was saying, I mean, it's just the way it is. I, I mean... Is it tedious sometimes? Fuck yes. I'm 57 now. Airports fucking suck. Yeah. Not every gig is a magical experience. But you never know who you're going to meet. And it yeah. could be anyone. It could be the Guyanese 
Uber driver who picks you up in St. Louis, who's fucking hilarious, an amazing, soulful person who's left a life behind to try to eke out something better and like is so brave and courageous. And, you know, you and you're only with this person eight minutes from the airport yeah. or whatever. And you just two people in the world laughing in a car, you know, but that little thing that doesn't even necessarily have to be a part of the narrative. It just has to be a part of that. You still believe that there's dynamic in, in meeting people and talking and laughing and sometimes yeah. crying, but I'm just naive enough to still see it as in the same way that I wanted. I picked music on a lot of levels because I knew it was the one thing that I would travel all the time. Yeah. And then you set up your little thing and then you put your vibes out there, you know? That is pretty weird. I, I feel like listening to you talk, the only other person who has had a level of success that you've had and tours as much as you do and travels as much as you do that seems to still love it. I got lucky. I met Quincy Jones in Havana maybe 10 years ago. Wow. And the joy he has to like travel and just talk to anybody. It's like, he's like, yeah, he'll tell Sinatra stories and I'll tell the story about like the cab driver in like Memphis. And you're just like, he... Everything is like new and fun and interesting and every person and everything and every sound and every, there's a particular joy that you don't find in a lot of, a lot of people. Like I said, I, I understand and you know, you get older. It also helps in my life that after all the rock and roll and all the experiences that I found Camille, my wife, because I found someone who she understands that some of that is problematic and some of it's a pain in the ass. And some of it's like, can't we just be nor do normal something? And like, by the way, we can talk about that and uh, do our best. But then she also realizes like she's an artist and she's a Pisces queen, moonstone child out in the world, you know, who wants to feel these things too. And, you know, my thing is the pandemic was such a fucking head trip yeah personally i didn't really find it creative I, I found it stifling but we were lucky enough to live out in the wilds of west marin and then we were in southwest colorado amazing yeah which was really really help but one thing i thought i would really flip out on was it was the first time since i was basically a teenager where i wasn't working and touring and singing and playing and doing the whole spiel and you know what it was rad. Oh, shit, really? You liked it? <laughs> wow. It, I, my head didn't fall off. You know, the, our lives didn't, you know, disintegrate into nothing. It was nice. I had time for a lot of other things. And it's funny, the travel part of it, I was just talking to my manager, Mark, last night about how at a certain point it would be nice to bow out from performing the way we perform before I can't because mm. I love the travel and we fit in the things that we want to, but it's different to be in a place for, you know, we're going to Paris. I'm going to see my friends. I know all the restaurants I want to go to. I know all the things I want to do, ah, but you got to leave in two days. Yeah. 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 And you have a show. When I was a kid, I didn't care. We would just party, go out, champagne, drugs, this, that, two days, do the gig, ah, go out, do it again, do the gig, ah, you know, like. It's all one thing, <laughs> it wasn't. Well, when you're young, you can do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't feel that now. I'm really happy being in the Black Crows and really fulfilling and satisfying and gratifying. But at a certain point, I just want, to take my wife and go to Sicily and eat linguine and clams and like, you know, drink wine and, you know, read Moby Dick for the third time or whatever. You know what I yeah, mean? Like, yeah. I just want to just be a part of everything going on. There's lots of places I haven't traveled. I haven't been to Africa. I've always wanted to go to Africa. You know what I mean? I, that would be nice to have some time to do that. And because Africa is such a huge thing to you know, I'm really interested in West Africa. I'd like to go to North Africa. It'd be cool to see East Africa. It'd be cool. You know what I mean? What, what interests you in West Africa? I don't know. I think maybe it has something to do just with the, I mean, I love North African music, but there's, you know, a lot of those West African music could be because of the horrors of mankind and the horrors of the slave trade. Yeah. Human beings found a way somehow through the vileness of that 
to communicate and share things in art and music, cuisine. Yeah. So many African parts of, especially in the deep South and people wouldn't, they don't even know they're, they're, they're yep. undereducated anyway. But with these things, you know, it's like, oh, every Southern person loves to eat fried okra, but okra came over from Africa, you know? Right, right, <laughs> right. Before that, okra came from India to Africa. So just dumb things like that, plants and fruits, vegetables, natural things and supernatural things that were brought over that could never be extinguished. Yeah. And I yeah. just have some sort of, and I don't even know what it is because I'm not obviously that knowledgeable as other people, but I can put a few things together and realize, you know, so much of the music, singing, rhythm things, guitar things, especially string things, come from a West African musical tradition that represents like this African mysticism and magic as well that manifests when people express themselves vocally and rhythmically and with uh, melody and things, you know, like a, a simple as something like a string guitar. And that is something that would draw me there first. Amazing. I see that in a first person and see what it feels like for me as a real outsider. Yeah. Outsider culture is important to me just because of whether my dyslexia or just whatever my tastes and my where I would find the things in life that are interesting, that make me happy, things that I can understand or help me for things that I don't understand to understand, you know? So a lot of that you have to kind of just vibe out and viscerally find. And I would be curious to see what it feels like. Yeah. Wow, we've gone from like psychedelic Hugh Hauser to like psychedelic <laughs> like Anthony Bourdain or some shit. <laughs> we've gone global now. <laughs> Call my agent. I'm down to do this job. That's amazing, man. I want to check out like uh, Robert Plant goes to Rocco. Morocco. Yeah. Yeah, he loves the Sufi music and the North African music. Yeah. And it's funny because I have this app where you can listen to radio stations all over the world, but it's like, wow, right on, man. I want to listen to some like rad Cambodian music. It's like, oh, uh, it's Nicki Minaj, like everywhere else. <laughs> yeah. you know? I know that's that's kind of a bummer about radio now. I mean, it's like, which is cool. I'm not bagging Nicki Minaj, but I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going to like get hip to some thing I've never heard, some regional vibes or whatever. And it's like, oh, it's, it's the same shit they're playing here. Is it that radio app? Like, yeah, the, yeah. Of the it's so cool. But there's some in Morocco, and then there's a certain kind of music that the horrors of things. There was a slave trade in Africa for a long time, too. You yeah. know, that within. within Africa, and they're bringing sub Saharan Africans to North Africa. But yeah. a great musical art form is born from it that still exists today. And there's whole radio stations that play it. And they're basically a living blues. It's the same tradition of like, the pain and suffering of the blues that these people brought with them that yeah. still lives today and is now celebrated as rebel songs almost. Yeah. It's like those North African like guitar, but like, I don't know how to pronounce their names, but like Narwin is like Narwin or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I saw their first show in New York many years ago. Really? I love that music and I love Sudanese music. And then you go over, I love Persian classical music. I love music from Afghanistan and I love Turkish music you know I I really have a lot of diverse interest wow. in, in things like that after this last break we'll be back with more of Chris Robinson we're back with the rest of my conversation with Chris Robinson within the crows like maybe like with your brother for instance does he have a similar musical palette I think he has an appreciation. I don't think his palette is as wide as mine. And he would admit that. I'm not, you know, he always yeah. said, like, growing up, like, Chris would bring back way more records than I would listen to or some I wouldn't be interested in. But I got to, he could be able to cherry pick what he liked. And yeah. he loves classical Indian music. I listen to, like, Mesopotamian sheep herder music and stuff. You know what I mean? Like wow. I, I'm really into a lot of different things. Do you listen to that stuff more than like rock and roll? Like you'd rather reach for that than a Stones record? No, I listen to things all day long. Like I like to start the morning with something mellow. We'll listen to a lot of Indian classical music or personally, I like to start my mornings with the late great Ben Webster or something. Lester Young, I love the Prez, you know, but we also love Rasan Roland Kirk and we love Thelonious Monk and we love Bobby wow. Timmons, Bud Powell. We listen to a lot of jazz, 
Yeah. We listen to a lot of blues, country, R&B, funk, soul, rock and roll, punk music, post-punk music, electronic music, <laughs> new age music, Rasta music. You know, Dog, share your Spotify right now. Share that Spotify account. <laughs> I'm trying to plug yeah. in, man. <laughs> Don't have Spotify envy, man. You know, like <laughs> I'm just obsessed. You yeah. know what I mean? And I, my obsessions maybe made me way more difficult as a youth in the music business because I. <laughs> I also associated a certain authenticity, passion, and purity to my obsessions and what I wanted to say. But I also have a waking life with music that has nothing to do with me making music or being a musician. Yeah, Those things are simpatico, but I'm sure it's annoying. I'm the guy who, I get the car to drive down to eat dinner in West Hollywood. I'm like, hey man, can I play the Spotify? <laughs> oh yeah, in the car. Dude, I got us kicked out of a sushi spot. <laughs> one time because I asked them to change the, the music oh, wow. and then they opened the same sushi spot across town so when we tried to go there a year and a half later it turns same lady was serving us she's like you look familiar I was like I don't know I don't know no 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 I wasn't so like, did you ask me to turn off the music one time I was like nah, no 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 it must have been my brother I don't know it wasn't me like hey DJ yeah. soy sauce you're not coming in here man. you know yeah, they, they weren't man. happy man <laughs> I was like, just change this. I could tell it wasn't like pre-pro. It's like, you're, it's on, you're on Sirius or some shit. Just, just change the station. That's all I'm asking. I'm just always, you know what I mean? I've just been adventurous and things I can access what makes things interesting to me. But I do that with, with a lot of art. I do that not with music, but with literature, cinema, most definitely. Comedy as well. So is all of that going through your mind as you're writing lyrics for The Crows or for your other groups? I imagine, yeah, I imagine it's something. It's all in there. But I think when it's time to focus like on writing a lyric or whatever, I've written songs with other people. I've written many songs on my own. The thing that is the Black Crows is Rich and I's contribution together. Yeah. You know, Rich, whatever he's coming from will play me something. There's a lot of psychic energy involved in it as well. And music is a great conduit to open those kind of psychic channels. And do you go into it with that intention? Like, do you have to set out to do that or does it happen? I think there's other musicians who can do the fucking math and know all the shit and they do another thing. I've only ever been able to access it this way. Got it. This is my process because of however, because we didn't learn music. We don't know shit about music. I don't read music. Rich doesn't read music. <laughs> but we know what it feels like and we know what sounds right. And then you keep doing that of course, through that, your vocabulary is bigger, but we maybe are using different words than people who are more knowledgeable about the inner workings and mathematics, the arithmetic of music. Yeah. It's something yeah. that has escaped us. But I think it's also in our, that makes it folk and that makes, you know what I mean? There's some sort of, that's why we look at look at it more in like, it's kind of magic when a song happens out of the blue. One minute, there's nothing. One little thing like this, and then I get an idea and then that changes what Rich is doing. And then it's all dictated by whatever the vibe is that Rich plays me. There's an emotional ingredient to what he plays me. Like our probably our most famous song is She Talks to Angels. He wrote that song, he was very young with the riff. And then we probably didn't get to it till like a year later when, but we would be playing things around mom and dad's house. Cause he was like 17 when he wrote that. Yeah, 17, I would be 19. So there's something about the way he pulls that first da, 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 that would just put me in a place to write a song with that kind of dark, romantic, melancholy imagery. Yeah. But we do that today and we do that, I think, especially if we get around to like where we're going right now or with this Happiness Bastards record and stuff. I mean, I think that's that's exactly what we've done with this. I mean, there's a lot more rock and roll on it. There's a lot more water under the bridge. We've lived a lot. We've Personally, I'm one of those people and I have two children and we want everything to be the best, but I'm also not afraid of adversity because I don't think you should be afraid of something that you have to find acceptance with, you know what I mean? Because it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, if you do it to yourself, if someone's doing it to you, if you have the means, if you don't have the means, no one escapes adversity and it changes, as you know what I mean, how we deal with it. The great yeah. energy and power of youth and where we came from in rock and roll was the anger, yeah. the fuck you part of it. Yeah, even with each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that yeah. boils into that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's like live fire, you know? And like, but it's also of great, you know, if you can get that yeah. into the 
soon and you can get in the studio and get it on there. You know, we weren't clever enough to do the math. We were only clever enough to wear our emotions on our sleeves. Did your parents pick up on your guys' tension? I guess. I mean, fuck. I, I mean, even more so probably the older we would get. But they weren't around when it was like, for some reason, you know, we he had his own bedroom. I had my own bedroom when we lived in the suburbs. And I had like a twin bed and a desk, stereo, whatever. Rich had like a queen size bed in his room for some reason. I don't know why he ever got that. But it was funny because when we were kids, and it would be like, if we started getting annoyed, we'd have this game where we'd both get on the bed and he'd be like, I'm Mad Max. And I'm like, I'm Snake Plissken. And then we would like, <laughs> see who could, who would win in a fight, Mad Max or Snake Plissken. And like, whoever could like fucking throw the other one off the bed was like the winner. Listen, man, Snake always wins in that. Dude, I was Snake <laughs> Got a patch on the eye, fucking cool outfit. I was like, it's my motherfucker there, you know? So, yeah. But like dumb shit like that. And then we've said it before, but we fought, brothers fight, but we would never punch each other in the face. We would hit each other, <laughs> body shots, throw shit at each other, try to strangle each other. Nothing yeah. from the neck up. It was weird. I don't know. That rule always applied. Unspoken, unwritten, just yeah, existed. No yeah. punched. I don't know. As if that <laughs> like makes it like worse than all the other cruel shit. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, Snake doesn't need muscles, though. Just being a pure badass is sometimes enough. Yeah, they couldn't stop him. You know what I mean? The crazies come out from under the street. He gets away from all of them. D d didn't matter. Great soundtrack. Great soundtrack to that. Amazing soundtrack. John Comforter is always... My favorite one is a movie he made called... Uh, is it called The Prince of Darkness? You know that movie? I don't know that one. Part of the trilogy he did that I, I think that Escape from New York, Prince of Darkness, and... Maybe they see or whatever. I think those are like a trilogy he made. But Prince of Darkness is a really cool movie. Like in this weird church in Oakland or whatever is like where evil is in like this liquid container. And like these people find it's really deep, man. But the man. soundtrack to that one's real. I listen to it all the time. I miss that one. I like I like Assault on Precinct uh, 13. That soundtrack's phenomenal. amazing. Amazing. Phenomenal. Very far ahead of his time, actually. Way ahead of his time. It sounds like what's, you know, like a lot of like electronic composers would now go for is he from kentucky i think he originally was from kentucky it's like if tangerine dream were from kentucky yeah yeah right if tangerine dream is from kentucky maybe they just call that like pineapple upside down cake dream or something I don't know. <laughs> how do you feel about the new record i think it sounds amazing yeah we're very happy i think we were really focused on what we wanted the record to be touring the last few years and doing the Shake Your Money Maker show. At first, I I was a little bit, I had a little trepidation about it just because I was like, oh, isn't that what other bands kind of get into sometimes is playing their most popular record or whatever. Yeah. But once I thought about it and I thought, yo, don't think about it, just do it. This is important mm -hmm. record to, you know, this is where it all begins for us. And let's revisit it. Let's see what happens if we remove ourselves from the way of thinking before, you know, why did I think that was dumb? Maybe it's not dumb. Maybe there's something there. And I think part of where the black crows are today is getting out of our way and, you know, don't think it, do it. And then you'll have more information about what works and what doesn't. And it was fantastic. And that was kind of the impetus to get us to like a real focused up tempo rock and roll record that hits all the notes i think that that we finally didn't have the perspective to know what the black crows sound like and to yeah. me happens bastards is like a arrow pointed towards the future for us of what the black crows could be and I, once we work with a guy like jay joyce who produced the record who's very uh successful popular producer we've never really worked with like a super producer like that yeah and yeah. you know we met so many talented people and had so many great conversations there was just something about jay well first off we felt like this guy not only can we get him but he could get us mm -hmm. and we're incapable of doing something that we don't feel is sincere yeah sincere to us of what of what we are wanting to want to do and how it sounds and and of course when he comes on board he starts to help shape the songs as well like all right we have a discussion about what i think the record should be what's the concept in a sense i mean you can't do it a hundred percent because it's music and things change but if that's what we're going for and so he you know we have a bunch of songs he comes in 
tells us what he likes about these songs. We go back, work on some songs, write some new ones. But again, as we're in the studio making the record, we it only took us two and a half weeks to make the record. That's quick. Yeah, yeah. And it has that energy. It has to be that way. Like I said, we're not the kind of people to, what are we doing, you know? And what are we selling? What do mm -hmm. we want people to get from mm -hmm. this? What are we putting out there in the world? And we haven't made a record in a long time. Basically, you got to like, you know, put your money where your mouth is. And if you're going to say this is what you are, then it better fucking sound like that. Yeah. And I hadn't made a record in so long and we've been talking about it. We've been proving it every night on tour of like what the presentation is, what the vibes are, what the band sounds like, where Rich and I are. But we're playing old songs and we're playing songs people know. And now to do it with something new. But after all the talk about we're a rock and roll band this is where we're doing this we're in a good place we're creative and but then you have to do it yeah do you think you could go out and play when you go out on tour you're going out on tour soon could you play a lot of this album or do you do you feel you have to make like do a lot of the old stuff I've, i mean that's the purpose of the tour and we've gone from bigger venues to a little smaller because we know you know, there's always going to be someone like, this is our new single, and they go to the bathroom or whatever. Yeah. Well, you 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 want to play the new record. Like, that's the point of this. Yeah, well, we feel that it's right there with the best of everything we've done. And as we move on from this new record and being able to focus on it for this period, of course, you know, we have to play She Talks to Angels, Hard to Handle, Jealous Again, Twice as Hard, Thorn yeah. in My Pride, Remedy. Yeah. You know, we know there are certain things, Wiser Time, Soul Singing, whatever. We know there are certain songs... I think when we were younger, we were more arrogant and we didn't want to play along. We wanted to push people more into, we're more than just these hit songs. And that was our right. And we did it. And we felt there was some importance there that wasn't just egocentric. Yeah. But I think now we realize and that, oh, we, we can we can say the things we want to say, but we also have to respect our audience and know that somebody's gonna be mad if you don't play She Talks to Angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by yeah. the way, I look at She Talks to Angels or Hard to Handle or whatever now in such a different light because I realize how special it is to have those songs in your catalog, you know, to yeah. have the songs that we play for people, but that after almost soon it'll be getting near 40 years that have been in people's lives and it's important to them too and they and they want to hear it and they want to hear you do the best you can do yeah and yeah. make it special and have that relationship with the audience yeah you said you feel like this is like an arrow pointing to the future like you want to do more black crows music yeah, I, you know, I mean, I know it sounds weird to like, you know, start wrapping up my 50s and talking about it. But then again, you know, there's so much about what we are as a band and as artists and as people that looks like one thing on the surface, but is not underneath. You know, in the same way that it breaks my heart a little bit to hear like people, musicians say that they are bored or listless or not inspired. And I'm like, well, I don't feel that way. And this yeah. record is really even greater sort of proof that uh, I don't have to give up on on my passion, on my creativity. I can put it all in the correct order. Yeah. And we can continue to move on. We don't have the same expectations that you had in 1995 when you made a record when, you know, you're spending a million and a half dollars on a record and they want you to go out and sell fucking 10 million records and have four hit singles and everybody's trying to do that and the radio is pumping your songs all day long and that's that's how it used to work kids <laughs> you used to they play your records all the time on the radio and people would go buy your record that's yeah. how it works yeah so even though that's gone that doesn't mean we we don't see or feel there is still some importance in that and i i don't feel that making albums is that antiquated or archaic or anything no. No. You know, people say, you know, you go to fucking Amoeba, man. You're going to wait in line to pay for your shit. It's not like yeah. there's humbleweeds blowing through a record store or something. <laughs> it's true. There are fewer around, but, you know, like, yeah. Go to Freak Beat in the, in the Valley. There's people in there, yeah. you know, and they yeah. have great records in there. It's like yeah. anything else. The media doesn't cover it because it would take too much imagination and interest in something that isn't status driven, All in right. something that is collectively, uh, more dynamic that contains more soulful information or something of a cultural reality that's not just 
reality TV and going to the gym or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so you do feel like there's an arrow pointed in the future. You want to make more music, but you mentioned earlier, maybe less touring at some point. Just a deposition? I have to give you a I don't date? know. I'm just yeah. curious. No, I'm, I'm just curious. Like, it's like, I don't know. Like, you want, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm yeah. just trying to figure out where you're at here. I'm going to have to answer a grand jury. I'm going to play this back to you. I'm gonna say, Remember, you said it. I'm like, Jesus. Reggie, you I, fucking oh. Miranda rights, man. Come on. <laughs> uh, yes, there will come a time. It's not, <laughs> it's not in the near future, but maybe, you know, give me another... Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say, you know what I mean? Because getting a bit older is weird because I don't feel older, but like, oh, fuck, my knee hurt or whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. It doesn't dictate my dreams and passions, uh, my age. But no, for the near future, and I think, you know, it would be pretty safe to say for the next decade of life, I want to keep doing it while I can. Yeah. That was another yeah. thing about the record. Like, let's make a fucking rock and roll record while we can still fucking rock and roll, man. You know what I mean? Because at a certain point, it's going to be a little like, you think you're rock and rolling, but it is. <laughs> Intensity level comes down, which is totally normal and fine. But rock and roll is specific to a certain energy that you need. There's all sorts of things that you can be passionate and you can... Uh, Again, have that kind of emotion and and there's still a smoldering intensity to those things. But I think if you want to get out, shake your ass a little bit, put on a rock and roll show, hopefully people still get up and dance and that's what it's about. Incredible, man. Well, look, man, thanks for thanks for taking the time to talk. I love the new album. I'm excited to see you play it and fun talking to you, man. You got a lot to say. I love it. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. Thanks to Chris Robinson for hanging out and talking about his career along with the Black Crow's new album, Happiness Bastards. You can hear it along with our favorite songs from Chris on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast where you can find all of our new episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced and edited by Leah Rose with marketing help from Eric Sandler and Jordan McMillan. Our engineer is Ben Tolliday. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you love this show and others from Pushkin, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and ad-free listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you like this show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. 